Hey everyone, heads up before we get into this interview. Most of the interview is about Sam's whole career, what got him into games, how he made it into the industry, etc, etc. But we do spend a section talking about Deep, a game recently cancelled by Leader Games that was a pretty hot topic online, largely because Sam was so vocal about his frustrations. Leader Games has provided some official statement both online and to other media outlets, and I have a few additional thoughts at the end. I just want to reiterate that it's a core principle of TCBH that our guests get to share their stories from their perspective, but I also understand that these stories can sometimes negatively involve other people in the industry. I'll have some more thoughts at the end, like I said, but I wanted to begin by saying that this is a complicated issue, and like most complicated issues, I'm certain that there's more than one side of the story. So with that said, let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Cardboard Herald. As always, my chance to talk with creative gamers and game creators. I'm your host, Jack, and today I have with me on the line Sam Bailey, the uh, designer or co-designer of Forbidden Stars, former FFG employee, and also the designer of the recently kickstarted Rambo and the recently canceled Deep. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Sam? Doing quite well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. So, you know, the the, the reason why uh, we're talking or how we got introduced is um, surrounding a lot of the, the, I guess, public controversy and stuff surrounding Deep. Uh, and I, I as tantalizing as it is, I think most of what can be said about the uh, details of that are available online for everyone to find. But... Um, I actually was looking at your your history of development, and I saw that you worked at Fantasy Flight Games, and so I immediately got super excited because it's so rare that I get to talk to someone from the inside of the the sausage factory, so to speak. <laughs> um, I've talked with Jonathan Ying before; that was uh, oh, yeah. really exciting. Yeah, he's a good friend of mine. Yeah, uh, awesome it, designer and great, great guy. designer, cool guy. Um, and it, it was just really enlightening. I almost feel like I'm Mark Marin talking to someone who used to be on SNL or something. <laughs> uh, you know, give me give me the dirt on on Corey like it's uh, like it's uh, Lorne Michaels or something. But no, I I'm, I'm a big fan of Fantasy Flight, and the, it, it's just a rare opportunity to talk to someone from the the inside of an industry giant. So, yeah, and even and even bigger in the end than when I started. Because yeah. when I started, Asmodee hadn't hadn't uh, partnered with them yet, uh, and we were in like a small little office uh, that would have been built out of like warehouse area. Um, and in the course of the three years I was there, I went from moving to a more traditional office building to getting bought up by uh, Asmodee, and then even right right before I left, we were about to move into being its own studio separate from all the Asmodee North America staff who had been uh, FFG employees previously. So oh, that's quite a that's journey. crazy. Yeah. And I, I totally want to hear more about that. And we will get into some of the stuff about uh, the future of deep and, and canceling games and that kind of stuff. So anyone listening to this and sounding disappointed that I'm saying that everything's available online, we'll, we'll, we'll have some deep talk, uh, but <laughs> I, I want a little bit of context uh, about you. Where'd you grow up, Sam? Uh, so I grew up mostly in Washington state on a small little Island um, called San Juan Island. Uh, so like 10,000 people live there, um, grew up in the forest, uh, running around imagining, um, I was homeschooled for quite a few years and my mom, uh, did all the curriculum that involved board games. So, uh, I remember playing a lot of, uh, Ravensburg, uh, Burger games, um, cause she worked for for Discovery Toys for a while, and they were the U.S. distributor for uh, Ravensburger. So I remember playing like the uh, Amazing Labyrinth for one. Um, oh yeah, dude! 
<laughs> yeah that game that's still i mean that's still a fun game now yeah uh, i have like, a copy in fact when i got a chance to talk with jamie stegmeyer like he he was remembering like childhood games like i think there was some early experiences with games something called like the the labyrinth the maze and i was like amazing labyrinth heck yeah you know <laughs> that's it, it's had a big impact on a lot of people i think and uh, chanted forest was another one um that, that i played with like these little trees that you would look at uh, and have different symbols on them as you go through trying to like put together fairy tales. But uh, so she was big into board games and playing board games with me. Um, and as I was a kid, like I just wanted to make more myself. So uh, it was always implanted on an early age to desire to design board games and, and make my own stuff specifically board games or were you one of those kids who's just creative with everything and just always trying to innovate on any sort of media that's put in front of you yeah i I guess to a point to that i think with like we didn't really watch a lot of tv as a family um and we didn't uh uh, my mom didn't allow consoles so when like consoles first came out because i was born in 82 so kind of like right when all that was starting and so we weren't allowed to have nintendo or anything like that i I got a game boy at like 12 and that was a huge deal and i abused it horribly and (laughs) played it when i wasn't supposed to um which confirmed all my mom's fears but uh um but yeah i saw my most mediums were reading and board games uh and playing outside so uh, did a lot of writing because based on that and then tried to design my own games and I think getting into Magic the Gathering when that first came out or like third edition so I was like I don't know I think it was like 10 or 11 and that just set my brain into overdrive I still have binders and binders filled with like probably over you know, like several hundred card ideas I like had most sets and had them all themed and um yeah, so it's it's funny flipping through them now and going, oh, hey, that mechanic ended up getting into magic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember as a kid looking at things like Duelist and Inquest magazine at the various submitted like fake cards and everything, or or um, reader suggestions or ideas, or even the. Um, the columns that were from like magic, the gathering developers and everything. I, I, I loved the, the seeming infinite possibilities of magic. Yeah. And I think that that's the reason why it is a platform has sustained. Not only was it kind of like the, the first in the door, but they really knocked it out of the park by having something that facilitated imaginative play. Like as soon as you play one game of magic, you can immediately imagine the infinite possibilities of what's out there. Yeah, in its own way, it like magic was its own medium as much as it was a game because you could just create this other stuff out of it, and that's why you see so many different types of magic. Like they, they invented uh, commander and and other ways of playing um, that ended up becoming official and adopted, but those were all originally fan made uh, kind of content. Um, so was your your mom's initial hesitance or maybe your your parents initial hesitance to video games was that a morality thing or was that like an educational thing like video games are going to fry uh, your brain but the <laughs> the magic the gathering stuff is you know sure there's skeletons and goblins and everything oh, but uh, she wasn't a big fan of magic the gathering either <laughs> <laughs> okay okay um uh but i think with with video games it was more just there's kind of that hesitancy when it first came out and you don't want your kids sitting in front of the TV when they got the big outdoors to go out in and, and that sort of thing. Um, Can you think of a, a couple cards that made a real early on impact on you? Like to me, I, I'm a little bit younger than you. Um, you're just about my older brother's age and he was getting into magic as soon as it came to Alaska, which I think is like one year after release 94 or so. And as proxy, I was getting exposed to magic and he needed someone to beat up on. So he'd be like, <laughs> here's some cards, you know? Um, and some of those early cards just like completely opened the door for, um, I guess different genres. Like I'd been exposed to fantasy before, but nothing looked like Sen Gear Vampire. You know, that that was like a, a revelation. You know, did the artwork really strike you or was it really the, the mechanical aspect that you latched onto? Um I think it was uh, kind of both. Uh there's definitely I mean the art 
definitely was not to the same level uh, back then as it is today. Oh, sure, uh, sure. And I and I was as a pretty imaginative kid, so I don't think I got a huge amount of the art. It was more like the imagining, mm-hmm. uh, wh- how the imagination led to that. Right. Uh, but definitely the mechanics and just the interplay of of like throwing, summoning stuff down and throwing spells around. Like I, I always liked, you know, you know, magic and imagining I had had magic. Uh, that I could use myself. Well, you grow up uh, in the Pacific Northwest and you're bound yeah. to be thinking you're in like some middle earth type of setting, casting yeah. spells in the woods. Yeah. I mean, me and my friends, we uh, made swords out of surveyor stakes. We cut down trees and built forts on the woods. Like we had a whole town of like six buildings that we constructed. Um, one that was literally uh, probably a bunker. We, cause we cut like all these, like uh, kind of smaller trees down and then nailed them to larger trees. And it was just this full on fort, like could have withstood a real attack. And we had, we read the Dragonlance novel books. Oh, perfect. Like the dragons of spring dawning and uh, autumn twilight or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then we would go out and we would act it all out. And one of my friends kind of was the dungeon master, but it was before he even knew what (laughs) he was. But he would like tell the story, and and as we go through, and so we had all these huge adventures. I still remember, you know, remember some of the escapades we had. Uh, one of the more memorable ones was we were going off into this area that we hadn't gone before, and we had rowed across the bay in a boat, and we're all walking up, and uh, he's like, "Oh, these giant rats attack!" And he's like, "We he start hitting this tree as if they were giant rats," and then he starts kind of flailing around and like crying out. And I'm like, oh, what is it? Like, what are we being attacked by now? Is it some horrible spell? My other friend just starts running down towards the boat. And then I realize that there are bees, probably wasps, there are wasps everywhere. (laughs) And he had just hit this this wasp nest that was like up in the tree and and had him going. And then I took off down (laughs) down towards the boat. Um, but it was just this like, Oh, suddenly fantasy turned into horrible reality. And, uh, we had to get out of there. Cast a spell of summon swarm of bees. Yeah. Oh man. Well, when did the idea of professionally designing games actually come into the picture? Like, was that the, the plan from get go? Were you like studying to, uh, master your designs or did you kind of stumble into professional game design? Well, there definitely was a point of like, geez, that would be nice, and then a point of, okay, I'm going to make this happen. Um, and probably the, the oh, this would be nice was back when I was like 12 or 13, like writing down magic cards and stuff like that. Of like, hey, some of these are pretty good, and I would show them to my friends, and sometimes we even like made proxies of them and played them and stuff, and and kind of getting that feedback of like, hey, this is cool, or like this is totally playable, and I'm like, oh, kind of makes you go. Oh, I could do what they're doing, um, and and but I think for f- more years than that, I was like planning on oh, be a writer or do something else. You know, there's so many things I wanted to do, and it was hard to narrow it down. Um, but I think kind of that point where it was like, hey, maybe I should do this professionally was my f- the first PAX I went to. Okay, yeah, uh, PAX PAX Prime. Uh, now you know PAX PAX West, but it was PAX Prime then. Um, and I kind of went with the idea of, you know, I'm going to do games. And this came out of, I worked at a board game store, Uncle's Games. That's a, a, a chain in Washington, uh, for a few years, um, and got really into board games then and just kind of realized like I had played so many board games, I had all this knowledge, um, and I really want to do this for reals. Uh, so I went to PAX with that in mind. Uh, asked a lot of questions. I would go to panels about board games, um, and then like stay after to ask questions. And like one of the main questions that I asked is like, you know, what degree should I get if I want to get into this? Like, what education could I do? And I kept on hearing, um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like what Political matters? Political science. Yeah. Well, no. It was like. I mean, there were some people that are like, you know, my degree kind of helped me, but most people is like, no, it, it matters that you do it. Like mm-hmm. if you wanted, if you want to do games professionally, go make games and go to conventions and meet people and talk to them. Right, and that's way more important than having any particular degree or a degree at all. So I was like, 
Well, I guess I won't go fifty thousand dollars into uh, student loan debt just for something that doesn't matter. And I started making my own games. Um, so at the time, uh, I was working nighttime security, and so you know I'd keep one eye on the video cameras, and then they had a computer with a um, publisher on it. So I just started making a card game. Um, that was a card game that was all spaceships because I really like the old like Star Trek. Uh, I think called like Fleet Command or whatever, where you get to control like a spaceship and you could adjust the power, the energy levels and stuff like that. And you like have these duels and stuff with these spaceships. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I wanted to try to capture that in a card game. So like a collect, or like an LCG style card game. And so I made that. I made a bunch of different races and put together and played it with friends. And, um, and at that time I started applying to FFG. And so I played, I think, four or five times over the course of a year, whenever something would come up that that was a design type position, I'd be like, "Yep, throw in an application." And then finally, about a year, I you know got an email back that's like, "Oh, we want to do an interview," and had an interview with Michael Hurley, who was the executive producer at the time. Um, and then they're like, "Yep, yeah, we'll fly you out for an interview." So I flew out to Minnesota for the first time, and um, how'd the interview go? Uh, it went pretty well, I think. So when I, I got there in the evening, and the kind of interview was the next day, and instead of like sitting in my hotel, I went to the the, the game center, which had a, a game night, and I sat there and I played games with people and stuff. So when I went in the morning, and in, their interview process was kind of, hey, hang out with us for a day, of like, so I hung out with Corey and. We talked about things, and we played uh, actually an early prototype of Eldritch Horror at the time, um, which is funny because he was, he like was asking me, so if if you were to do a new edition of any of our games, which one you do? And I'd be like, it would be really fun to do a new edition of Arkham Horror. Uh, and he's like, oh, I got something to show you. It just so <laughs> happens. Why don't you check this out? Yeah, but I think like that when I kind of mentioned that I had come in and played games the night before rather than just you know sitting around waiting. Um, I think that impressed him as well as I talked about, like I had actually gone and done through a process of making a card game myself. And so all the, all the advice that I'd gotten of like, just go make games, I think also helped in that because they went, Oh, someone who's actually gone through the process of iteration and development and everything by themselves, you know, has, has, you've already learned a lot just from doing that yourself, even if it's not a game that's ever going to be published or anything. So, so during the interview itself, what are the questions, I guess, geared towards like hypotheticals of how you would approach certain concepts or if there were certain uh, ways that you would adapt thematic elements into mechanics or, or, you know, is it more like the typical, you know, tell me how uh, you deal with angry customers you know I, I i don't know what what sort of context <laughs> you have what's in your a, greatest strength and your greatest weakness yeah uh, my greatest weakness is that i am too dedicated i'm so humble that's yep. my greatest weakness uh no um it, i mean it's been like six years now uh but if i remember correctly it was more conversational right. than it was like like there were questions along the way but it was a lot more chatty than like a informal situation it's like I got introduced around and shown around the office, and then we like sat down and played games for a bit. Um, it sounds and like they were trying it. to figure out more so if you'd be a, a good fit. Like maybe th- what you'd submitted yeah. in the past had kind of shown that you had some chops, or you at least had, um, you know, some dedication, some dedication, <laughs> and, and like you, you were a lump of clay that they could work with, but they wanted to see if you'd actually fit in well with the culture. Um, yeah, which is a cool way of doing interviews and everything, and it's a good way of making sure that you feel like supported and part of a team environment because it's definitely a whole different beast. I can imagine designing games for a big company like that with a huge crew as opposed to, you know, designing something now that you're going self-publish on Kickstarter or something. Yeah, but it was a nice interview, and uh, yeah, and I went home and, and I got the word, hey come uh, move to Minnesota. So got my, my, the agreement from my wife and then moved out there. And I, I stayed, I moved out for six months before she was able to come. Cause she was finishing up school at Western Washington university. And, yeah, then I worked there for three years. 
So what was your experience there? Like, did it meet your expectations? Was it, you know, what was the biggest surprise about working in this larger environment compared to what you expected out of uh, developing board games? I don't think I had a lot of expectations just because you don't see a lot of representations of it in like normal media. Like, I guess I kind of assumed it would be more like a normal office. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was probably less so than that, at least when we first started, because it wasn't really a a standard office building, but we moved to that after about a year. Um, I I really enjoyed like the collaboration when I was able to like work on other, uh, with other people there. Um, And I guess I was, I was surprised at how many, how much of the process I was involved in. Like, I think when I came, I was imagining more, oh, I'm going to do the design, and someone else is going to do the art, and the graphic design, and all that. Um, it's going to be handled by other people, and there, and to an extent there are, but, like, we do, the designers did all the art briefs for all the art pieces. Right. So, uh, like, that was that was surprising. I didn't think I was going to be able to do that, which was, kind of, which was cool, actually, um, to be able to kind of be involved in the greater vision of the game and have more control over it, rather than just... Uh, doing the design and stuff. Well, it looks like you worked on a bunch of expansions for uh, different games there. You know, you had a bunch of Talisman and XCOM and then some Elder Sign stuff. What is it like coming up with an expansion to a game that's not yours? Like, is that foreign to you in any way? Is there a certain process that you approach the base game with in order to to come up with an expansion? Like... uh, I, I guess I'm more used to talking with uh, designers who they are the, the auteur of a game and they're also the ones who are primarily developing all the continued support of that game down the road. Yeah, because uh, I got hired as a what was called a content developer at the time. Mm-hmm. So y- we didn't design games. Like, it was just doing expansions. And as you know, with FFG, you know, expansions are a big thing for them. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> um, so I originally, my first product was Firelands for, for Talisman, uh, which was actually ridiculously cool because I had played every edition of Talisman. And Talisman is exactly as old as I am. It came. It, it was introduced, I think, at the in ni- in eighty two, nineteen eighty two, in September, and I was born in July. So, like, almost as old as me. But like, growing up, uh, we played. We had we had a board game place on the island that we would go and play games, and they had old all the old editions of Talisman. We played all those, and never did I imagine that I would. <laughs> designing expansions for this game that I had played in through middle school and high school. Um, so that was really cool. But uh, it is a different process to design as to develop. And I think both, and I think it, it fundamentally comes different strengths of, of a designer. Yeah. And there are designers who are really good at designing, at creating new mechanics, creating new games who aren't always so good at, at like the refinement, the development process of of taking those core ideas and turning them into this streamlined, balanced, uh, well polished machine. So, um, do you take a look at what I guess player feedback and issues are with the game and look to resolve those, or are you trying to innovate on the game in order to? I, I guess truly expand to come up with uh, uh, new elements to make the game bigger and broader or is it just a a combination of the things and it's unique every time you go in there's working at ffg it's different than if i were to do my own thing just Mm -hmm. because there's certain direction of like hey this is what we want um but i feel like an expansion should often fundamentally change the way you play the game like an expansion should be something for people who have played the base game uh quite a bit and now they've got this expansion that comes out and it kind of breathes new life into the game and and changes the way it plays um there are some some games have room for the the more of type game mm-hmm. uh, or more of type expansion um like the for example like the first uh elder tour expansion was just like more cards for all the decks because there just wasn't enough 
in the core game to, to fill in all those decks to give enough variety. So like more of that was really nice. Um, but mostly I want expansions that, that fundamentally change the way you, you play the game and then add something new and exciting to the experience. Um, and, uh, and I did. I definitely did look at the forums and what fans were saying about what they didn't like about a game or uh, you know what they wanted to see more of. So, like, for example, Elder Sign, uh, when I did Gates of Arkham uh, with Richard Lanius, uh, I read a lot about how Elder Sign was too easy. Uh-huh. And a lot of people are complaining how how easy it was and uh, how it was very challenging and kind of they were losing the fun factor of it. Um, so one of the things I really w- pushed in, in Gates of Arkham was kind of this increased difficulty level and this increased challenge, uh, but also player choice in how difficult they wanted it to it. So like introduced with the, the ancient old ones um, had, a, had a difficulty level to them so that you could go, oh, I want to play on insane or I want to, you know, let's just have an easy game here. Uh, so there was some scalability because I also found out that there was people who thought that Elder Sign was way too hard and it never won a game. <laughs> yep. um, Why I had like playtesters, these great playtesters, they were fantastic uh, from Italy. Um, they had almost they had never lost a game of Elder Sign until they played Gates of Arkham, and they only lost to like the insane level uh, ancient one. Um, but they were they were really nice because they had a math background. One of them was a math professor. And right. they gave me statistics for every card in Elder Sign. Oh, well, that's handy. With uh, like, they gave a weight to every every reward, every penalty, uh, percentage of of success uh, of succeeding at the adventure, depending on what dice you had available. Um, and that was fantastic, and really helped me refine that. And that's why I think Gates of Arkham is. Like it, it breathed new life into Elder Sign for me, and I played so many games of it, but I would still play a game of it. Right, right. Now, Omens of Ice is an expansion that you had the the designer credit on, not uh, co design credit, right? Yeah. So yeah, that one was that. Um, I mean, that that's special to me in that very few games are actually set in Alaska. And if you <laughs> if you followed me on Twitter, um, <laughs> you'd see that I go on runs all the time or, you know, I'll be in a coffee shop and I'll just snap pictures of, you know, whatever it is, you know, clink it artwork or uh, just like the, the landscape as I'm running outside next to a river. And I'm like, designers, if you're looking for a great setting, look to alaska you know the our tribes here the native tribes would love to partner with design companies designers i'm sure they would love to do consultation on traditional folklore all this kind of stuff and to actually see a expansion come out from a big time publisher and have it have like an inuit village card it was like whoa this is crazy cool the um uh, the the artwork in the game really captures a lot of what uh, my image of old timey Lovecraftian era Alaska would be. I mean, I have the page brought up in front of me, and uh, there's this one artwork that struck me about the expansion when I first checked it out, and it's this uh, the street, and you see some um, like old Model T style cards and everything, and it looks like images directly out of uh, his history books of alaska you know here in Juneau, alaska we still have boardwalks that look <laughs> like that so uh it, it was crazy cool to me that there's this alaskan expansion to elder sign and uh, so i i don't want to take up all the time on this one thing but i do want to know like as the sole designer on this one were you the driving force for the setting of Alaska? Did someone else pitch so Jack London esque stories to you? What's the what's the scoop on the, so this expansion? The uh, uh, Owens of Ice is based on uh, the Ithaca expansion for the digital game. So that that had already happened, and they wanted mm-hmm. to use the assets and stuff for that in part in this in this new expansion. But there wasn't actually a lot of art. That was 
that was based in that area because uh-huh. they had used it a lot from just the Cthulhu card game. So all I pretty much was told is like, hey, translate uh, uh, the Ithaca expansion to to physical. Yeah. Um, and the first iteration did not work at, at all. Like doing a direct translation of the Ithaca expansion where you like start on the museum and then you get like expedition stuff and then you go off to Alaska does not work well in a physical <laughs> game where you actually have to clean up all the cards right. and set out the cards again. So, so yeah, there's a whole mechanical thing. But um, So I actually have a connection to Alaska too. Uh, my dad... Um, runs a charter boat business up there from St. Petersburg to Juneau. Oh, that's and awesome! I've been up, and I've been up there a few times, and it's always like very, been very inspiring uh, to like all the fjords and the big mountains and the the waters and everything. So it was really cool to work on this expansion because um, I had been there and and had like that feeling of it and really enjoyed it. And my my. Uh, my brother lived up in Alaska and did like crab fishing. And my dad, like years ago, did like fish, did, did uh, salmon fishing up there. Um, my, uh, my nephew is, is part uh, native from, from that area. So when, when I got this put on me, um, I'm like, I want to do it justice. Yeah. And so I did a lot of research on like uh, the, the native tribes and on um, on the history of that era. I got a lot of reference pictures. Um, tried to do a lot of references um, uh, to various uh, various uh, features and stuff. Right, um, right. So, like, there's I think there's a card called like Ford's Tear, mm-hmm. um, and that's actually a place in Alaska that I remember going up. It's like this inlet where the tide uh, can be really strong and can like sweep out surprisingly. So they call it the <laughs> yeah, there. yeah. There's Ford some went up there in a kayak and <laughs> some hazardous areas up here for sure. Yeah, yeah, you you totally nailed it as far as you know whatever direction you gave to the art team and and whatever you recovered from the digital expansion and then implemented yeah. into the game. It, it totally tonally fits what I want out of it. it and the 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 piece of artwork that I was mentioning downtown Anchorage. I mean, I I grew up in Eagle river, which is just beyond the mountains that are featured in the card downtown Anchorage. And it's like surreal (laughs) to be like, wow, uh, this is, uh, actually where I'd watch, you know, people get ready for the Iditarod over here. Kind of crazy. Yeah. I, so in uh, slightly also attachment is, in fifth grade, I think our teacher did this whole thing about the Iditarod, okay. and I still have the photo that we all got of like the winning team that year. Um, uh, but some is like some references I put in is like uh, there's like the old old movie that, that did not age so well called the Nick of the uh, Nanook of the North. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's, there's right. a character in one of the allies that you get in, in uh, Owens of ice that is actually the real name of the actor uh, that played it. Oh, that's uh, cool. Uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, but uh, Al Ala Kagilak, I think it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I, I base and I base the image uh, of that like on the actual actor's name, act, actor in the movie and stuff. And um, like I, I did like some research on the like the language. So there's like one one art piece where it's like uh, in the in a museum with like a frosted over glass and there's like writing on it. Um, but that was that's like actually the uh, actual language uh, of one of the tribes. Um, right. So yeah, I tried to. Well, then let's just touch on one other aspect of your time at uh, Fantasy Flight here. Yeah. Yeah, How did you get lumped in with the uh, Forbidden Stars project? Because that is a cool game that's very beloved, and sadly, the the whole debacle surrounding Games Workshop and uh, FFG is making it so it looks like it might not uh, ever see the light of day until maybe those two kids can play on the playground again. (laughs) Yeah, so um, when it it first was started to get developed, uh, it was just James Niffen. 
Um, James Neffen also worked on X-Wing. Uh, he's one of the designers for Armada, Star Wars Armada. Uh, and um, now, he's, now he's a manager there at FFG. But uh, I remember like I was working on Talisman and I had like pretty much I had nothing else to do. I was just waiting on play testing to kind of see what the next iteration was. And I only had this one project cause I was new. So all I had was this talisman expansion. I had nothing to do. And I'm like wandering around kind of like seeing if I could help anyone with anything. Um, and I see him, he's like sitting there and he's like drawing stuff. So I sit down and I talk to him. I'm like, Oh, what are you doing? It's like, I'm doing this game called forbidden stars based in Warhammer 40 K. And I, I had played lots of Warhammer 40 K growing up. Uh, and I liked the world way more than I actually liked the miniatures game so much. Cause <laughs> I I'm know not, how that goes. <laughs> uh, I'm not so great at painting miniatures. And so everyone would make fun of me. Cause I would, ha- I had this Necron army that didn't have arms on it. Cause I would like got to paint it before I put the arms on. And I just never did. So it was just these armless Necrons was my army. And, but, uh, um, so I like, we talked to him about it and went back and forth and it kind of got put on hiatus, um, until like the next year. And then the next year he kind of started working on it again. Um, and James really likes, like he's a really good designer, but he doesn't like combat in games so much. Like he doesn't like conflict part of board games. Like, he enjoys a lot more the building and discovery and, and that sort of thing. Right. Um, so he's like, hey, I want this game to have a really good combat system, but I don't think I can do that justice because I don't enjoy that. So uh, they kind of were looking around for someone who had free time, and I happen to have some free time. So they're like, hey, Sam, why don't you help James do this? Um, I'm like, okay. So I went down and and, uh, started doing the combat system, and that kind of bled over to me, like, helping with uh, all the other aspects of it and doing a lot of the content development and changing a lot of the cool rules. And, like, I came up with a victory system when the old victory system uh, Christian didn't like. uh, So we, like, had to come up with something new, like, last minute um after like testing the game for a year we're like oh we gotta change the fundamental part of the game but it, it ended up working out way better so it was a good call uh, on christian's part uh and then Corey kind of came in towards the end and uh like he had done starcraft so like the core mechanic of of the of the order tokens was already his but he came in towards the end and helped refine things and and help with the rule book and stuff um, and then, so I went from being like, oh, help with this thing, do some content developer to like, you know, the co-designer, um, which is really cool because I hadn't had a chance to do that because I'd been kind of doing expansions this whole time. So being able to work with that core game and come up with uh, fundamental um, foundational designs was, was really a different experience and really cool. And um, I think, I, I'm not sure I'll ever be able to really be forbidden stars like it is a very cool game and i i can sympathize with that uh idea of like i i like games that have combat in them but i'm more interested in the exploration and development of powers and and seeing how you can utilize the space and maybe the the struggle and threat of combat is more interesting to me than the actual resolution of combat itself but I had a blast with Forbidden Stars and the asymmetry was was really incredible. And um, even though that typically wouldn't be uh, my kind of go to game, it it really spoke to me. And I, I was sad to see that its lifespan was ultimately uh, relatively short because of the Games Workshop and Fantasy Flight to Divide. But then again, yeah. you know, something may be on the horizon. Maybe something will get resolved. If people truly, truly, truly love a game, there's always a way to work out the the, the legality issue of it if people are willing to put enough money into the licensing aspect. Yeah. So th- that's a that's a hell of a design. Yeah. I can imagine that you are, are very proud <laughs> uh, of that. Yeah, and I was so ready to do expansions for that too. Like, oh, they, dude, <laughs> they hadn't they hadn't officially like tasked me to do that. But I was like, usually uh, when a core game comes out, if there's going to be expansions, they start development on that expansion right after the release of the game. Right. Um, so that it, you know it comes out like a year later. 
So I had like lists of ideas. I'm like, okay, this is what Necrons can do, and this is what Tyranids can do. And you're making uh, the board gaming world sad right now. Like, oh, oh yeah, where's oh, my should... Tyranids? I mean, I've already I've already uh, pretty much talked about this a lot on the board game geek uh, forums because right. I've been pretty involved with the Forbidden Stars. Because once the games stop being developed, like they don't answer questions for it anymore and stuff like that. So. I try to pitch in and, and talk about these things because they're just really passionate fans that they have, that actually have like developed all their own um, own expansions at this point. A lot of fans have come up with fan content for all these different races, and they're I, just like you, know. you with your original Magic the Gathering designs. Yep. <laughs> so, so what was the exit from Fantasy Flight? You know, it sounds like you had a pretty sweet gig going on there. What was the the reason you ended up leaving? Um. It, it wasn't it was involuntary but uh nothing i can really get into detail with okay uh, yeah well i imagine but, it's, a, it's a pretty hard business uh to be part of super competitive and all kinds of things going on there but that at least kind of frees you up to do you know some other independent designs and shake things up yeah is that when deep kind of came into play or were you working um, on that so I stopped working at FFG um, in December of I think it was 2015, and I, you know, talked to my wife, and she had, you know, gotten a pretty good job in Minnesota at that point. So I was like, you know, what do you think about me trying to do freelance board game stuff? Because I don't want to like suddenly switch gears and and try to find another career or anything. Like, see if we can make this freelance thing work. So I started. I made a prototype of a game. Um, in time to like start pitching it at Origins, uh, and there's a few developers there that really enjoy uh, publishers who liked it. Um, so I'm like, okay, this is cool. And there's a lot of like follow up that's going to happen at Gen Con. But when I get to Gen Con, uh, all those people who are interested, like for some reason or not, like couldn't do it. And then like one of the ones who was really interested had uh, were had focus elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, so it was Simon. Uh, and I go in and like play test with these people with like um, their designers from Brazil. They it was right before their announcement of Rising Sun. Oh, so like halfway through me like trying to teach us, like one of them has to go to take care of that, and I didn't know what it was. At the time. <laughs> and someone else like jumps in, and then I had to like re-explain the game and stuff. So they were just like their attention was totally elsewhere, and it right. was. It wasn't a good a good show, and the other people who were interested was Plat Hat, who then got bought in the meantime between Origins Gen Con got bought by Asmodee, and they're like, well, now we're not accepting anything anymore. Right, uh, right. So I had gone to Gen Con with Leader Games because um, I had met uh, Patrick Leader at PAX South uh, that f- January, so pretty much the month after I stopped working at FFG, um, and found out that we lived like ten minutes away from each other. Uh, and you know, and Bass was cool and all that. So we're riding back from Gen Con, um, and I'm like kind of bummed. And I'm like, and and Patrick's like, oh, you know, uh, what if you did a game for me? And I was like, yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, like I kind of been wanting to do something like, um, kind of like uh, Forbidden Stars. Like I really like enjoyed that sci-fi setting. It's like, oh, I had this this idea for like an asymmetrical sci-fi game and we like talked it and hashed it out and came up with the rules and stuff and it's like yeah why don't you i'll commission you to do this game um and so that's how deep started pretty much spent the next four months um developing it uh by myself um finding groups to play test putting together prototypes and everything for that yeah, it seemed like you were really public with your designer diaries and, you know, keeping updates. Like, I, I remember hearing about uh, Deep pretty early on, what feels like, you know, a year ago or so. It, it didn't really surface again to my attention until, you know, a couple of weeks ago when it was canceled. And I was trying to puzzle the this second together. time. Yeah, so it was canceled twice. So it, what's the what's the history here? Because of the uh, the slight controversy, I don't I don't want to say anything in air. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and you know, again, so, I, I'm not interested in like yeah. salacious scoops here. I, I'm more interested in just kind of understanding it, your path as a designer. The yeah, when when I originally started designing it, the end goal was to put on Kickstarter in January, and then we we got into more development and, kept, and the Kickstarter date kept going pushback. 
Uh, it's like, oh, we'll do it, you know, in a few months, in a few months. But, you know, I thought it was going to be a while just because there was no, uh, you know, no graphic design had really been done yet. No art had really been done yet. So it, like, took a while before Kyle Farron had a opening to start doing art for that. And then it kind of rolled around into July. And I think at that point um, there was some tension in, like, communication. And at this point my goal is just to get the game made and 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 give a product over to the publisher that they're happy with. I, I'm good handing this over and saying here is here is my final product. Let's let's do this. And so, uh, at what point does it get canceled initially? The next week, early next week, I pretty much get an email <laughs> that says it was like we decided not to publish the game and we're going to go with a different designer. Then it's what just, changed that it was back on to get canceled a second time? Like, did they have a change of heart or, you know, were you changing the mechanisms of the game to make it more fit whatever the, the expected leader house style was? Or, you know, how did it have an opportunity to get canceled a second time? Uh, I went to Washington in Washington, D.C. Uh, that September. So like a few weeks after it had been canceled and stuff. And then uh, talked with uh, another designer that's that's pretty well known. Um, but I don't want to I don't want to say who that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they said, "Hey, I know Patrick. I'll talk to Patrick, and maybe we come to an agreement." Mm-hmm. So he would talk to Patrick, and they kind of come into an independent agreement that you know this designer will kind of take what I had designed to do his own thing with it, and I would and it would be a co-design. And then you know, November, December, January. Um, I'm uh, mostly focused on uh, moving to Belgium because I'm moving to Belgium. Oh, okay, that's a that's a whole nother a whole yeah. other thing. Yeah, but uh, so a lot of focused on that, and then I hear I get I, I you know poke Patrick from time to time, and go hey you know what's going on, and it's like oh yeah I've talked to that designer and you know I'll update you, and then 20 days goes by and I'm like hey what's going on? A few days later is when I get an email that's pretty much yeah it's canceled for for reels uh and then i go into board game geek and see the 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 announcement in my in my mind it kind of forced me to force my hand into responding um and also just i had gone gone through talking with a lot of designers after this like being freelance you get to know other designers a lot and many stories of of them getting um not treated well by publishers and taken advantage of and stuff and i'm like right i don't i don't want it to be like this whole thing to just be secret and hushed over like it has with a lot of other people that are just uh, designers who are afraid to to talk about it because they don't want to ruin their chances and i think that just uh, leads to more designers getting taken advantage of because totally there there are published out there that can get away with it so yeah, and uh, I encourage anyone listening to this to to check out the stuff online. And uh, yeah, and, I try to make and, it clear that like I don't, I'm not looking to sue anyone. Yeah. I'm not looking for people to attack anyone or right on, on anyone's behalf. Like, like I I enjoy Vast. Root looks really cool. Like. I, I want to enjoy board games too, and I know that people want to enjoy board games. I just would like there to be a way where, you know, people don't spend a year developing a game that just gets thrown out the window with no recourse and, and get taken advantage of. Like, I think there's room right. for everyone to do well and everyone to be happy. And Exactly. Like that. and, and that's, to me, the compelling story here and the thing that's worth sharing. And, you know, the... I, I can't speak to every meeting that happened behind closed doors. And I also don't have Patrick on here to, to give his okay. own side of things. I, I think the, the fact that there are so many people who are trying to design games and there's so many people who are uh, publishing games now and publishers are uh, always looking at new designs and, may not necessarily uh, be able to juggle as many projects. I, I got to imagine the world of independent game design is relatively cutthroat at the moment. And you don't hear as much of the stories about the the people who, you know, were kind of in limbo for a while and then their game got canceled, that kind of thing. And, and that's a lot of why I, I think this is an important uh, story to share. So, 
you know, like a, as far as what publicly stands, you know, deep as a design, a mechanical design was reverted to you. And this is what was put into the, the public post, but the, the artwork and any sort of like, um, uh, thematic development is like reserved by leader games. Is that right? Like the name itself or, well, that's what, yeah, that was their claim. The design is still something that you believe in and you, you want to have that eventually come out yeah. in one shape or form. Yeah. And I, and my philosophy of, uh, designing is, um, having the theme inform the mechanics and the mechanics inform the theme of like building upon and, and putting them together. So that's why I think like them claiming the theme kind of touched off just because like this game was designed around this theme like it was built on top of this and so to go okay you can have the mechanics uh but we're taking all this other stuff it's like that that's that's the game that's part of the game that's like Mm -hmm. ripping out the foundation of a house and saying here designer have all this this wood and and stuff that was built on top of this this is gone now that's that's now just a pile of rubble because it's they're all interlinked with each other i i don't have uh, someone else from leader games yeah. uh, here to to respond and so i i'm sure that you know they could have a, a very different side of the story and in the board game geek threads for for yeah. deep that are there now they they do give some of their side of the story and uh again any listeners for this i encourage you to to read it all yeah. if nothing else it, it's it's compelling because it, it's a very rare public I guess fallout between designer and publisher where both sides believe something else happened. And um, I, I'm not trying to say anything specific about uh, leader games here, uh, but you know, in the, the world of indie board game development, it, it's a tough world where people have to make a lot of tough decisions uh, can have, uh, wildly different contracts as to who has the rights and, and what is the right of any one individual creator and who's contributed what, what's been iterated on and what has been readapted into to other games and that kind of stuff. It, it's something that is worth at least understanding the discussion, if not um, taking any one side on it or another. And I think that's the the real value uh, for everyone else, and not only this part of you and I talking about it, but also for the the uh, greater board game world out there, because that's something that I've noticed in going to conventions and going to unpubs and talking to people who are incredibly passionate about their designs, and they, they love games, and they know their craft of creating games, and there are people who have successfully kickstarted games and are now taking on other people's designs and the formalities and experience within business is very different when you compare the experience level of something that's like fantasy flight games versus uh other smaller independent publishers out there um and so i i think the fallout if nothing else is is a value for other independent designers to, I guess, learn more about what the other aspects of game development are beyond just how do you manufacture and how do you design a game. The good news is is that you have plenty of designs and credits under your belt, and then you also have upcoming games. I mean, I'm sad that we've eaten up most of our time here, but we can at least uh, finish up with (laughs) a a positive note of you got Rambo on the horizon, and I was at PAX Unplugged this year, and I was like, what are all these headbands that I'm seeing? (laughs) And and I'm like, whoa, uh, Rambo game. Chris is the uh, CEO of... uh, uh, everything epic games um he he loves rambo and he had all those headbands made he was so enthusiastic and handing them all out and and on a good note like he has been wonderful to work with um just great publisher great to work with uh very receptive um can you give me also, like your your one minute pitch of what rambo is and how you adapt rambo into a board game <laughs> Uh, Rambo is a uh, co-op uh, minis like scenario game um, based on like a squad setting kind of modern 
Uh, my two favorite things about the design is that it has a pretty cool stealth system so that you can you know, either go through the game being all quiet, hiding in bushes, taking out uh, your enemies with your, your big old Rambo knife, um, or you can go in guns blazing and, and drive your alert all the way up. Uh, but then all the enemies see you and shoot at you, um, and how you play is kind of your choice, and you can have different play styles in the same group. Uh, and the other mechanic I really enjoy is uh, called is the stances that you kind of pick what your stance is at the start of each turn, and that kind of determines what you can do. So rather than like a lot of these kind of miniatures games, it's like you get one move action and one normal action or two normal actions or whatever. Uh, it all depends on what stance you pick. So if you're going to be running, you, like you get a lot of movement and, and you get an action and stuff, but you're probably going to make some more extra noise. Um, or you could like go prone where you know you're not going to get to move at all, uh, but you might recover some of your cards or heal some health. Um, and that's kind of up to you and what you want to do. And you have to pick that at the start before anyone has done anything, anyone on your team has done anything. So there's a nice planning aspect because uh, I think that's important for co-ops that there's discussion at the table. That it's not just, oh, I do my thing, you do your thing. But it's like, okay, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to do this. Okay, that's going to, I'm going to do this instead. And kind of having this planning time in a co-op, um, which is I learned from doing kind of learn doing Elder Sign, uh, mm -hmm. doing a uh, co-op game with Elder Sign and with, uh, in part with XCOM too, of like just seeing what's fun. Um, cause you want, you want this collaborative puzzle and not just everyone working on their own edge quietly and not interacting. So anyways, that's more of a rambling, rambling pitch of <laughs> a Rambo, rambling but, uh, <laughs> Rambo. I, I like it, but yeah, um, it, it's successfully funded on Kickstarter. Um, should be having in, in a few weeks having uh, kind of pre-orders up for that and uh, yeah I'm really excited with it you got some other projects you're you're juggling around at the moment yeah I've got a, a game um, called lawyer up which is a courtroom drama two-player kind of drafting game um, <laughs> that sounds exciting okay yeah which uh, is tended to, which I have signed a contract with um, Rock Manor Games. Uh -huh. uh, they're a smaller publisher. They did a game called Maximum Apocalypse. Um, they're also having a game that's coming out soon called uh, Set a Watch. That's exciting. And then, what's the Belgium thing all about? Is that board game related at all, or is that? Uh, I got uh, hired by a digital game company. Uh, that's awesome! Design. Congratulations. Um, yeah, and they. The company does uh, kind of card game, board game type games. It's kind of like Hearthstone esque. Okay. In, yeah. In that, you know, it's like it's card game, but in a digital space. Um, so they kind of do that. So they brought me up there, and it's been it's been a big learning experience because now I have to learn all this stuff with uh, scripting and uh, the digital stuff that you don't have to deal with board games, where it's just like, oh, totally. I put this. I, I come up with the words and I put them in a card and uh, <laughs> they make sense. And it's like, no, now you have to go to the scripting and tell the computer how to, how to do all this stuff, how to do your card. And it's actually, I try not to limit my design space based on my programming abilities. Right. <laughs> right. Like, I, I don't know if this will work at all. It's a cool idea, but it might not even work. Well, that's great. Uh, for our next adventure. So you got a so lot of just, stuff me coming. And, me and my wife are just hanging out in Washington waiting for the work visa to come through so that we can uh, move move out there. Well, then I think that's a great positive note to, to end it on, and I'd yeah. love to hear about the, the world of digital game development if you... Uh, <laughs> If you yeah, get some time a year from now, we can talk about how this kind of shifted from, you know, wh what the approach changes uh, yeah. from one type of platform to another. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Sam. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you very much for having me. Whew. This was a tough interview to navigate. I'm glad that we ended on a positive note there. It always sucks when someone feels burnt and their hard work was wasted. So I told you I'd have a little bit more to say after the interview. I did reach out to Leader Games for comment, and on the record, they said, We appreciate the opportunity to respond on your show, but Leader Games has already responded to Sam's statements and doesn't wish to contribute to a new conversation. We wish Sam the best as he moves forward with his career. 
Also, after editing the episode, but before recording this outro, I spoke off mic with Cole Whirl, designer of Root and an employee of Leader Games, who is pretty involved in the whole thing. What I can say is that it seems like this is a tough situation born out of lots of people who want to create really great creative stuff that they believe in, and the end design was not getting there, and when it fell apart, all parties felt pretty dang frustrated and burnt. That said, I think it's still helpful for any of you listening, designers, publishers, artists, anyone getting involved in creative industries with independent publishing, go into your creative projects with a clear understanding of terms, expectations, outcomes. I'm not saying that you can always avoid situations like this because you can't, but you can go a long way to protect yourself. And honestly, it makes it easier to admit when you haven't held up your end of the bargain too. Bottom line, I'm really glad Sam came on the show. These topics can be tough to talk about, but are also important to hear, and he spoke about them earnestly and from his point of view. I'm thrilled that he's got a promising career in digital development on the horizon, and that he's still working on games. I'm thankful that Leader Games has given us a statement and has retained some composure, and they are continuing to make some really cool games. Also, from every other experience I've had interacting with someone who's worked with Leader Games, be it an employee another designer, someone volunteering to work at a booth, not to mention the, the interview that we did with Patrick himself very early in our TCBH history. It's all been positive all around. If you want to read more about the fallout surrounding Deep, I put the link to the official cancellation post on the BGG forums. Sometimes when it comes to these types of things, just doing the most research and coming up with your own understanding is the best way to go. So I encourage you to do that. I really appreciate you guys for listening and uh, just a couple other things here. I wanted to say thank you for listening to us. As always, everything we do is ad-free and audience-supported. If you'd like to help keep it that way, find our Patreon link at the top of the webpage, CardboardHerald.com. We have several levels of support with various rewards, including us saying thank you on air. So I wanted to say thank you to new patron Hawken Jones. He's a musician, lover of Star Wars, connoisseur of fine podcasts, and certainly a gentleman and a scholar. For a man of such refined taste, I'd love to play him in something like, I don't know, something tight and kind of singular, but also beautiful and and robust in its table presence. Something that, that feels very refined. So maybe Sagrada or a Zool. That sounds like kind of Hawkins vibe that I, I think would be artistic yet also strategic and work really well for him. So cheers and thank you, Hawkin, for your support in becoming a patron of TCBH. Speaking of Patreon, I'm proud to announce, like super <laughs> proud to announce, that Stonemeyer Games has sent us some promos for our holiday boxes that we'll be sending out later this year to patrons at the journeyman level or higher. And they're joining Weird Giraffe Games and Ellsworth Games and pledging their support to TCBH and our patrons. Lastly, if you enjoyed the show, we do a whole bunch of other stuff, including reviews, interviews, and recommendations across writing, podcasts, and videos, which can all be found by visiting our site. Once again, CardboardHerald.com. So with that, I'll sign off. I've been Jack Eddy, and thanks for hanging out.